Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Now, I mean, I love my voice. I think my voice is beautiful, to be quite honest with you, if I should say so myself. But it's nothing compared to, you know, my girl right there. One of my one of one of my employees doing such a sensational job. I love her voice so much. She's a, she's a Jamaican woman, you know, and she loves the accent and the whole bit. So she's gonna introduce our next guest rather than me do it. I want to hear her do it. Solange, take it away. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> What's up, Coach? Good to see you, man. How's everything going? Grab a seat. It's good to see you, Coach. How you doing, buddy? How's everything? I'm doing great, man. Welcome to Austin. Listen, it's a beautiful city. I can't front. And, you know, you, you don't have to pay any taxes, any state taxes here. I mean, you keep more of your money living here. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, last year, 12-2, and two, uh, got to the uh, semifinals, the college football playoffs. Put into your words what kind of season it was and how did you feel about how things went? You know, for us, it, um, it was kind of a three-year journey to mm -hmm. get to that point. We, when we took over, year one was rough. Mm -hmm. And uh, five and seven, we didn't have one player drafted at mm -hmm. the University of Texas in the NFL draft wow. after year one. Year two, we go eight and five. We have five guys drafted. Bijan ends up going in the first round to the Falcons. Mm -hmm. Year three, we go 12 and two. We win the Big 12. Uh, we were a play away from playing for a national championship. And we just had 11 guys go to the NFL Combine, wow. which is a record for the University of Texas. So the journey's been, been pretty amazing. What has been amazing about you being here? What is it about this place that made you want to be here so badly? we got to remember, history lesson, go way back to Vince Young, 2005 Rose Bowl. Oh, man. One of the greatest games I've ever seen. Ever. Yeah. I was calling plays for USC in that game. Wow. And I'll never forget trying to throw Reggie a wheel route early in the game, and the linebacker runs stride for stride. I said, shoot, man, they run like we run. Right. You know, we, we thought we had the fastest team, biggest, baddest dudes on the planet. Right. And Texas had a great team. And then Superman, I was called Vince Superman right. now, he beat us that night. And so I'd always held Texas in a really high regard from afar. Um, and so when this opportunity came, when I was at Alabama with Coach Saban and some opportunities were coming my way, I said, okay, it's going to be a reality. I'm going to be a head coach again. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure it's the right spot. And when Texas called, uh, I remember going home to my wife saying, that's the one. Mm. And if, if we can get to that job – and get that place turned around. This is my opinion that this is the greatest job in America. You've had a top five recruiting class over the last three years, your three years here. Did you anticipate that being a reality? I felt like we could. Mm -hmm. um, our footprint is incredible, obviously, in the state of Texas. More players um, signed Division One scholarships out of the state of Texas, more mm -hmm. players drafted in the NFL draft, but also the brand, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you see that Longhorn, it doesn't say Texas above the top, it doesn't say Longhorns below it, but everybody knows is hook em horns. And so the footprint, not only in the state of Texas, but as you sweep the country, we felt like we could recruit anybody in the country, not just because of the history and tradition, mm -hmm. but the city of Austin mm -hmm. and, and what's happening in the city of Austin here over the last five, 10 years. And then obviously the, you know, the education piece, you know, we're, we're a top 10 public university in the country. Mm. You know, I look at Texas and I say to myself, great city, great locale. Obviously, you look at the university, it's spectacular. I've been there before. I've been spoke there before. I love the university. I love even more the fact that you guys have departed from your conference and you're now joining the SEC. I personally think that that's going to be something that's epic and, and not just because of the conference itself, but because yourself, obviously, in Texas A&M, going to resume your rivalry, going to be going up against one another. What do you think that's going to do for this program? Well, I think it's going to be big, you know, Inevitably, when you when you take over a program, you're trying to look at where where are the holes in the program, what are your issues, and one of the things that was happening to us in recruiting was the SEC schools were using it against us. Mm. You want to play in the SEC, right? You, you, we have more players drafted year in and year out than any other conference in the country, mm -hmm. and so now we kind of get that back, right. right? We get to take that back. But great games. I mean, we're we're playing we're playing the Red River rivalry one weekend. Right. 
the very next weekend we're playing Georgia here, yeah. right? And so that those opportunities for our players, they want to play in those marquee games. And so now the opportunity is there, renewing the rivalry mm -hmm. with A&M. All that stuff's going to be fantastic. Give us an inside look. I mean, we can talk about it from afar. We can talk about it as fans. We can talk about it as pundits like myself and others. But when we talk about a conference compared to another conference, there's this mystique. This conference plays this way. That conference plays that way. We look at the Pac-12 a lot of times. People would assume, you know what, they're really about offense. They don't play enough defense. They're not physical enough. They're accustomed to you know, Southern California, stuff like this, right? I look at it from the standpoint that I'd like somebody like you to explain what life is like playing in the Big 12 compared to ultimately going in the SEC. What's the difference you believe is going to exist and people are going to look at it and say, wait a minute, this is a different thing. This is a different level now that we're here. I think the biggest thing, and when you look at the SEC, is the line of scrimmage. When you look at the amount of defensive linemen, you know, there's a lot of games we'll go into in the Big 12. We'll say, hey, we got a block number 90, okay? He, he's, a, he's a premier guy. He's an NFL player. And that might be one week, might be the next week, might take three weeks for there to be another first-round type draft pick. You go on the SEC, it's every Saturday. And they might not have one, they might have two. You might play Georgia, they got five. I mean, they have five NFL defense on And that's, that's the challenge week in and week out that you got to be good up front. The coaching is tremendous, obviously, and then the speed on the perimeter. Mm -hmm. And so when you start to build the team in this conference, you've got to be great up front. Mm -hmm. You've got to have playmakers on the perimeter. And like any league in football, I don't care if it's a little league to the NFL, and you know this as much or more than anybody, you better have a trigger man, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what it takes in this league. That's why I think it's so hard to consistently win in the SEC conference. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what, Co what Coach Saban was able to do. Yep. That's what Kirby's been able to do in recent history. Mm -hmm. Teams have had moments, mm -hmm. but they haven't been able to sustain it for an extended right. period of time like Coach Saban was able to do. Second game of the season, you guys beat Alabama. You know, I said Todd all day, every day, because <laughs> it wasn't really about ever Al about Alabama to me. It's about one of my favorite coaches ever in the great Nick Saban. He decided to retire. He's hanging it up. He's going to be doing what I do, you know, except 10 times better, by the way. What is it going to be like for you to look at that sideline, to look at Alabama, and to not see that man coaching on that sideline? It'll be definitely unique. And, and first of all, I got a ton of respect for Kalen DeBoer. Yes, Shoot, he, he beat my butt in the semis this year, yes, you know, to, to go play for a national title. But Alabama, Nick Saban, synonymous, right? I mean, and, and I remember growing up, it was Alabama Bear Bryant yeah. was synonymous. Yep. And so now um, what, what Coach Saban was able to do, in my opinion, the greatest college football coach of all time. Same here. I mean, what, what he's been able to do was, was incredible. Uh, but they still got great players. Mm -hmm. They still got the, the history and tradition. Coach DeBoer, like I said, he's, got a he he's a heck of a coach. They got a heck of a staff. They're going to win a ton of games, right? Mm -hmm. So nobody feels sorry for, right. for Alabama. You know, it's like they're <laughs> crying from the yacht somewhere. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, but but they're, they're still going to be really good, but it is going to be different. You know mm -hmm. I mean? What, what, what Coach Saban was able to do there, the amount of players he produced in the NFL, the championships they won, um, you, you just kind of have to kiss the ring every time you see him. Talk about what Saban has meant to you doing my research and reminding myself of – when you said where you are right now in life, you're in a very, very good place, you're healthy, you're feeling good, you're looking good, obviously. It has a lot to do with Nick Saban because he saved your life because he mandated a medical exam for you. Tell our audience about that and what, and what yeah, that this was is, about. This is a fascinating story. Um, so every offseason at Alabama, which we've now instituted, you have to go get an executive physical, okay? And so I go do my physical. I'm in great shape. It's COVID. You know, everybody's made a gym at their house. I bought everything I could off of Amazon. I got <laughs> crap everywhere. Um, so I go do my executive physical, and part of it was uh, was to do one of the tests. There, there was a little bit of a line. I see the doctor. Man, my stress test was great. My blood works great. We're walking out, and the gal says, oh, we can do this one last thing. I said, okay, great. I go, I go do the test. Uh, I'm halfway home from Birmingham. The nurse calls and says, has anyone ever talked to you about an aneurysm or a heart murmur before? And wow. I said, no. What are you, what are you talking about, right, though? Right, right? Right, yeah. What are we talking about here yeah, right yeah. now? Uh, and in the end, um, within four days, I had open heart surgery because I had an aneurysm in my heart. Wow. Uh, that what they call in the, in the medical world is the widow maker. That, you know, a lot of times that's get misconstrued. Somebody had a stroke or a heart attack. A lot of times they have an aneurysm that, that ends up that ends up you know causing their death immediately. So 
Um, without that, I might not have ever found that. And so mm. I always say Coach Saban saved my life twice, mm. one of which he saved my career by giving me mm. an opportunity was all, when I was on the street right. to come back as an analyst, and then two, to have me go do that executive physical to get my heart fixed, mm -hmm. and here I am now. I'm at the University of Texas. You know, when he, uh, it, when, one of the great, great moments I've ever had in my career, he asked me to come and speak at the University of Alabama. I was there. Yeah, that's right. You were there. And we sat in his office for an hour, just he and I, you know, talking. My brother-in-law was with me, too, but he was just sitting by. And the life lessons this man gave me about to keep on going, keep, no matter how successful you are, it doesn't stop. You got to do it again. As long as, you, as long as that's your occupation, that's what you're doing, you got to do it again. Is that what he instilled in you, or do you feel that's something you've always had? Well, I think I had it, but I don't think that I had the discipline that he has. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's one thing about Coach Saban. You know, he, he – it, it, it's one thing to say and have your players want to do something, staff members. Mm -hmm. It's another to live it. Mm -hmm. The discipline that he lives his life with on a daily basis – I mean, God knows what could be going on inside that building, but if right. it's Wednesday at 1 o'clock and he's supposed to be watching third down, damn it, to quote you, he's watching third downs. Right. That's what he does. I mean, his day is so regimented uh, that, that to me it, 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 forged, it forced me to find my routine of who I was, what I was, how I was going to go about my business mm -hmm. on a regular basis, right. and then the consistency of my messaging to the players, mm. that I wasn't ever asking them to do something that I wasn't capable of doing mm. or willing to do myself. Gotcha. And, and it, was, uh, it was remarkable to watch the mm. level of consistency in which he did it, and he just never settles. He Speak never settles. You brought up players and the kind of message that you want to consistently give to your players. Speaking of players, I got somebody here for you. It's an all-world brother right here that just broke records. Just broke records. Sending his jersey at the NFL Combine, you know, to, to, to the Hall of Fame, the one and only Xavier Worthy. Come on up here, man, man. Come on up here. What's up, my man? Good to see you, man. How's everything going? It's good. Well, well first of all, I, I'm not going to lie to you. It's the first time I meet you in person. I, I expected you to be a lot bigger. I'm like, <laughs> damn, I expected you to be a lot bigger. I mean, you're not that big, bro. Not. But you can ball. Congratulations on what you did at the, uh, the NFL Combine. What was that like for you? Man, it was crazy. Um, you know, growing up, watching the NFL Combine your whole life um, and getting on that stage and just doing something like that is just life-changing. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at you right now, and obviously you've got aspirations to go to the next level, and you will be at the next level because you just have the talent to do it. You heard what the coach just talked about as it pertained to discipline, really instilling that to maximize whatever potential that you have. What has it been like playing for this man? Uh, man, it's been amazing. Uh, just coming off of just when I even doing recruiting, I just left Michigan and I put my trust in him. I didn't even see the, I didn't even see the city yet, see the school, no nothing. I just put my trust in him, and it's all worked out for me. When you look at last season, and I'll ask you both this question. Obviously, it was an incredibly successful season. Some people say it's great to get there. We got there. We were in the national semifinal. Some people get so close. They're like, you have no idea how bad it hurts when you can't close the deal and win that national championship. I'll ask both of you this question. Which category do y'all fall under? It hurts. <laughs> I was sick. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts. It hurts. <laughs> right. Yeah, you, you're just sick, you know, as competitors, uh, which is what we tried to recruit. I think one thing that's unique about, about X is – he was the first recruit we had when we came on board. Mm -hmm. And that, that signing class had already signed, and then we were, we're, we're trying to assemble elite competitors. And as a competitor, you want to win the last game. And when you, when you get into the, onto that stage and you don't win the last one, the immediacy is you're sick, you're frustrated, right. you're right. upset. Now that we're, we're – couple months removed now you can reflect a little and be proud of the the you know the accomplishments along the way but in the moment you're, you're absolutely sick what about you you said it all man i was sick i couldn't even i couldn't think about nothing else but that playing at a university like this and and listen let me tell y'all something about college college can truly truly be the best years of your life make no mistake about it damn it i miss it every day i miss it every day and i gotta tell you something when you're in college especially when you enjoy success one would imagine that makes it that much harder to leave, even though there's incredible opportunities moving forward. Where's your mindset at right now? 
Mr. 4.21 in the 40. Where, 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 where's your mindset? <laughs> Wreck it. Man, uh, shoot, just leaving college, it was a hard decision. But uh, even coming into college, I feel like I kind of had like that three-year plan just to get in and get out and do what I need to do to take care of my family. Mm, fair enough. Coach, I got to ask you this because you enjoying the success that you're enjoying right now. When you think about a guy like Nick Saban who elects to walk away, you heard NIL. You heard transfer a portal. You see his age. He's over he's 72 years of age. And it's like, okay, I've done enough of this. Enough's enough, okay? And that seemed to have affected him. When I looked at him, I never dreamed that he would retire this, this, this offseason. I never saw that coming. I thought it would be about two more years. Were you surprised at all? And what, what do you think about when people bring up the NIL, the transfer portal? You know, I, I don't know if I was necessarily surprised. Um, when you've accomplished what he's accomplished, um, and you have an opportunity, he's got an amazing wife, Miss Terry, and you got an opportunity to go work um, in your industry, yeah. play a bunch of golf, do do those types of things. He's going to make money. Oh, he's going to make no a mistake ton about of he's money. Gonna, he's going to make a bag. He's already for made the, a ton of money, television. and he's going to make he's gonna probably more. He's going to make more, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and I think in, a, in, a, in his own way, he feels like he can impact our game even more not being at one institution. I, I do think in some way, shape, or form he's going to be involved in college football. Um, but to me, you know, he taught me something when I was there that, that I've held on to as well. You know, he always says there's a reason dinosaurs aren't on the earth anymore. They couldn't adapt. Mm. And, in, and in college football, you either adapt or you die. And we've had to adapt. In the, in the three years since I've been here, the transfer portal has kicked in. Uh, NIL has kicked into place. Signing days have changed. Uh, how we account for scholarship numbers have changed. Conference realignment has changed. And so we've had to continually adapt. And so my degree, I, I don't think so much that he just didn't want to deal with it. I just don't know if he felt like, man, do I want to continue to adapt? Mm -hmm. Or can I go maybe help college football in a different way right. uh, and still make a ton of money? Got you. Xavier, when, you talk, when I talk about you playing for coach here, what's the kind of words and advice that he gave you prior to you making your decision to move on and to go to the next level? And what's the kind of things that he said to you guys, not just you, but your teammates, about what you need to do to be successful? Um, I feel like the best thing he's ever taught me was your three phases of life, which is work, um, personal, and what was the third one, Coach? Your social. Your social. Your, your, your <laughs> social. Your social. I know it was social. There's an academic piece in there. You don't have to worry about <laughs> yeah, academics. Yeah, I don't worry about academics. <laughs> yeah. But it was academics. But right. I feel like that kind of taught me just to go about your business a certain way. I feel like if one phase of your life is messed up, he said the other one's going to mess up. How prepared to, do you think you are for the professional ranks as a person? I know what you do, what you believe in yourself as a player. Mm -hmm. As a person, how much, how prepared do you think you are? And tell us why. Um, I feel like I grew over time at Texas. Um, I feel like Sar Coach Sark kind of prepared us for this moment. Uh, like I said, three phases, just taking care of your mental and just growing up mature, maturing in life. Um, I feel like that's what's going to lead me to having all the success I need in the league and personally. Coach, what are you telling about social media? You got to have something. You got to have some advice you're giving folks about social media in this day and age. Well, it's all the, it's all the right. same stuff, you know, I, and I think that the reality of it is, is what, what we're trying to get across to these guys is the moment you hit send, it's forever. It never right. comes back. You, there is, you, you can hit delete all you want. Moment you hit send, it, it's forever. And so I think those choices and decisions that we try to, we try to get across to these guys, um, because they're now, now more than ever in college, these guys are building a brand, yeah. right? And they're either creating value for themselves on all their platforms or they're devaluing themselves. And so I think when we can get them to understand that their brand now is – a social media brand, it's a public interview brand, mm -hmm. it's a style of play brand, mm -hmm. it's who you are in our community brand. Those things are important. We're really fortunate here in Austin. I think our players are really fortunate in that this is a this is a big city now. We, yeah. Austin has grown into a, a major city. We don't have pro sports. Mm -hmm. We don't have NFL, NBA. Major you are League their baseball. pro sports. We are the pro sports team. So these guys have had to grow up kind of in this spotlight that I, in my opinion, what I would tell him, he's prepared for it because of that. Mm -hmm. Not all of it has been pretty, and he'll tell you that the same thing as well because yeah. the scrutiny is a lot more than maybe other schools players would get. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I think they're more prepared for what, what the scrutiny of the NFL would look like. Your coach ain't lying, Xavier. He ain't lying because as a person in the media, I can tell you right now, 
I can meet you. I can have a lot of love for you. But at the end of the day, what you do in a public setting, we can't avoid it. Because right. if we avoid it, then we're not doing our job, and then we'll be held accountable in a way that you would be held accountable for. Right. And so you got you to gotta call it like you see it. But the kind of advice he gave you is absolutely right. And here's why it's beneficial. Because if you listen and you follow the guidance that he gives, you'll make even more money because it'll be beyond the playing field. Because when people invest in you, it's because there's something about you that they're saying they trust. Right. And that is where it all comes in. Coach, I'll end with, by asking you this one last question before we go. Alabama was dominant for years. Georgia was a two-time national champion before they missed the college playoff football playoffs this year. But when we look at quote-unquote dynasties per se, we thought Clemson would dabble years ago when they had Deshaun Watson and the Trevor Lawrence. We thought they was going to do that. We saw what Georgia did. We saw what Alabama has done. Is that still possible to have in college football today considering how loaded some of these conferences are? And these I, programs are? You know, I, I think it is because I think that the, the, the playoff evolving can help. You know, I think one of the challenges with being a dynasty with, with the setup that we have with the four-team playoff, what was, it's hard to get into being one of the four teams. Georgia just found out. I mean, they won 27, 28 in a I row. I like 12. Yeah, and they, I wish it was but, 16 yeah, playoff teams, man. And maybe we'll get there. We don't know yet. Maybe we'll get there. But I think it's going to give a team, let's call it like ourselves, now we're, we're, we're going to go play Michigan in week two, and that's okay. You can afford a loss or two wow. and get into the playoff and then may the best team standing win it all in the end. And so I think it is going to create an environment and opportunity for the best teams to be willing to play big games and still get into the playoff and have an opportunity to win come late. Coach Steve Sarkeesian, wide receiver extraordinaire Xavier Worthy, right here with Stephen A. on the Stephen A. Smith Show YouTube. Thank you all so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Coming up. I got to transition away from the world of sports. People had an issue with some of the things that I said about the damn State of the Union address the other day. I'm not backing up. I'm going to say it again. Plus, I got some other stuff to talk about. Don't go anywhere. Stick, stick around. It's the Stephen A. Smith Show. Back with more in a minute.